Today is November 10th. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki, Naganago, Mekoche, Chestokom Aki. My name is Red Thunder Woman. My English name is Michelle Robinson, and I use she and her pronouns. Native Calgarian is being recorded on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the imposed U.S. Canadian border are the Blackfeet. North of the border are the Siksika, Ganai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. These lands were Treaty 7, signed September 22, 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony Nakoda, Wesley Chiniki Bearspaw Nations, and the Dene from the Sutina Nation. I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit, status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non-Indigenous are treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. I honor the Blackfoot as the elders and members have been so kind to me in my Red Road journey. Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my spirit name. I was born here in Calgary or in Blackfoot Mokinstis as Michelle Elliott, an English name which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act and Post status card by the Canadian government says Yellow Knives Dene. My father is so Canadian, I am a daughter of the Mayflower and a daughter of the American Revolution while having an Indian Act and Post status card. I acknowledge my Dene lineage and that I was born in Calgary, but my family is not part of the Treaty 7 signatories. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Hare People, also called the Great, La Great Bear Lake People in Treaty 11. I'm a native to Turtle Island, and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area called Clincho Tine Indahe in Satu Dene, meaning many horse town, named after the Calgary Stampede. Land acknowledgements are critical to creating a safer space for Indigenous, as well as honoring the host as a guest and acknowledging our role as treaty partners. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot elders and language keepers as I learn proper pronunciation. Any mistakes or misinterpretations will be on me. I encourage questions so that misunderstandings can be cleared up as soon as possible. I do not speak on behalf of all Indigenous, but I share what I know as I walk down the red road. If you're experiencing emotional distress after anything we talked about today and want to talk, call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 1-855-242-3310. It is toll free, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there's also a text option at hopeforwellness.ca. For non-Indigenous, there are distress center lines in your area as well. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you to previous donors for already showing your support to the show. If you value listening and can afford to give, thank you. To those that cannot afford to give but listen in, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com. Send in your comments or questions. And I also have a YouTube channel. I'd love to have you subscribe. Go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pin posts on social media. And I want to give a shout out to my super loyal donors, Adam, Agent Indian, Alexandria, Beatrice, Ben, Beth, Brian, Kat, Celine, Christina, Crystal, Diana, Jacqueline, uh, Jana, Jenny, Jenny, sorry, Jessica, Jocelyn, Judy, Karen, Kathy, Kenna, Leah, Lisi, Marisa, Melissa, Morami, Natalie, Nathan, Rebecca, Rochelle, The Sprawl, Shara, Sharon, Tammy, Tiffany, Thela, Vanessa, and Veronica. Whew, that's a lot. So today I have a wonderful guest with me. Jenny, it's nice to meet you today. Nice to meet you too. And Oki, thanks for having me on. I'm very, very, so it's such a pleasure. And what, a, oh. what, a, what a wonderful land acknowledgement too. It's oh, nice. thank you. Well, the pleasure is definitely all mine. I'm so happy. So basically what happened is uh, I'm a part of a group called Sovereign Spirits. And uh, they're the new two-spirit uh, group that's here in YYC. And, you know, they're like, hey, did you all know this is happening? I'm like, no, I had no idea. So then I totally stalked your profile and I'm like, hey, I've got to support this. But what is this that I'm talking about, Jenny? Well, um, it's actually a new project that we're a new publication that we're launching um, called uh, Big Kitty Magazine, um, and it's coming out uh, in print and digital format. So it's coming out in print um, in early December with uh, 10,000 issues um, hitting the streets of Calgary. Um, it's a free publication, and it's 
be featuring arts and music and subculture, um, but it has a big focus on diverse voices, uh, so LGBTQS voices, as well as BIPOC voices in the city. Um, and just kind of exploring like all those hidden gems that we have in Calgary. Um, and um, it comes, this so Big Kitty comes from, uh, originally, um, I'm the founder of Big Kitty Crew, which is the largest all-female identifying arts collective across Canada, and we have a new chapter in the UK. Um, so uh, we do all kinds of collaborations and collectives and a lot of like community mentorship programs um, for female identifying artists um, of all different disciplines. Um, and we've been running that for about 11 years. Um, and I used to be um, the art director of Beat Root Magazine. So um, when my old publisher was like, I think it'd be fantastic to have a voice that's uh, younger and female and a BIPOC voice, bringing kind of um, like showcasing a lot of the independent culture in Calgary um, instead of kind of like the like you know having just like the regular like mainstream like white places kind of <laughs> to talk about it yeah so, I get a little tired of those so <laughs> <laughs> and there's just so many cool pockets in our city um, of so many even like cool like like cultural like sub like, like cultural groups. So like our, our, our big feature for our first um, issue is actually on Afro, it's, it's called Afro Wave. So it's featuring um, a lot of um, West African born artists who now call Calgary home um, and entrepreneurs. And they once were kind of like shaping a lot of the contemporary culture that's going on right now. Cause, um, and often you don't see all these little pockets. So we have like stories on like the Filipino breakdancing crew and also like indigenous makers and all kinds of different stories. Um, yeah, and profiling on and so having with some local businesses involved um, and everything too. So yeah, we're really excited to kind of have have this new voice um, to bring to Calgary. It's going to be kind of a cross between like Vice and Juxtapose and Beetroot, um, and it's going to be a quarterly. So it's not going to be as much as listings paper, but it's going to be way more about just uh, different features and stories and sections to kind of share all the amazing um, things that are happening in our city in terms of makers and collaborators and people who are really kind of making a difference too especially um in, in activism as well oh that's awesome yeah no we have so much stuff happening um so one of the things that i, I have this small contract with uh, chaos and uh chaos has this grant to get all of these films made and we're calling them indie films but uh they're really uh you know the love of each creator all of these indigenous creators making these uh films so, you know, my boss had put a whole bunch of those into like the film festivals, film, film festival uh, circuit. And as a result, we're getting some of those being shown. So, you know, um, we're trying to scramble to make a plan on how to really promote them and things like that. So this is really great timing. And I just I hope that I, I can figure out a marketing strategy, somehow figure out how this all comes together, because there are really cool people doing such cool things in the city. But like you and I, we've literally never met. And I'm like, who's Jenny? I need to meet yeah, Jenny. I'm amazed that we've never met before. Because I, yeah, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm really, I have been working in the Calgary Arts community um, since I was uh, for almost the last 20 years now, probably. So I started like working uh, when I was like 16 at like an independent record label. Um, and I worked throughout, um, so throughout the arts and community. So I was at Quick Draw Animation before. I'm a graduate of a ACAD or AU Arts. I'm doing, I'm currently doing my master's at Emily Carr um, and in my last year. And then, but I've also worked for One Little Rabbit and Trickster Theater. Um, and I do a lot of arts education uh, programs too. And I'm cur currently the museum school coordinator at, at the Glenville Museum. And, I, and I've, I've been an educator there for the last few years. And that's so like I work really closely with indigenous elders all the time. And I've done a lot of education programs programs um, with Stony Education as well too and like workshop programs. That's amazing like your resume is ridiculously like perfect for the arts community and I um, I'm a brand new newcomer to the arts community. Um, I actually used to draft wells and pipelines before I had my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <so that> changes. <laughs> I know it's well and it, it it happened by chance. I um, experienced a lot of racism when I gave birth so then I uh, ended up you know, going down this world of activism and politics and running and all of these things. And um, I just find, keep finding myself in the pockets of art, which is like the only place that we can really express ourselves, it seems like. And, uh, and the irony is too, like when I started this podcast, that 
my husband just, he put a mic in front of me. He's like, you are doing a podcast, end of discussion. So I'm like, okay. So we started doing this podcast. And then because of COVID, we started going online. So now I have the YouTube uh, component of this and realizing that, you know, there's so much more to talk about, like outside of indigenous issues, or activism, you know, there's just really cool people that I want us to showcase because you know even cbc news like i find it really you know white centric i find all the mainstream media white centric and you know we're in the time of like indigenous education and black lives matter and i'm really unpacking a lot of things as, in my own journey as an indigenous woman but also that bigger picture that you know i had bias against blacks and i didn't even know it but when you're raised in this culture you don't know you don't know what you don't know um and i should say i didn't know what i didn't know because that's really what it came down to i didn't know um and you know learn, unpacking what ableism is and all that sort of stuff so um and i come across these amazing people like last night we were um we there was a, a panelist discussion at amnesty international and we were talking about they had a, a person who just got diagnosed with autism uh, I was on there. There was two uh, brown people who were uh, academics, and we were all unpacking what digital activism looks like. And it was so much fun. It, it was it was just fun listening to different people talk about their experience and what they're studying and or what their experience has been. And um, you know, I would love to have each one of them on my on my podcast. And it's just unbelievable how many cool people there are, and nobody showcases them. So I know. it's like, it's so sad. It's hard. It's like, there's just so many cool things. I mean, I always meet people like every day. I feel like, oh my God, there's so many who are doing such brave things. And I, I really applaud you for going into activism. It's such a, it's like, it's such an important field. And these conversations are so important to have. And, um, but it, I, I know also how exhausting it can be too. And lots of, in so many ways, especially um, being somewhere like Calgary in Alberta. Right. But yeah. it doesn't mean those conversations are any, or they're even more important to have in places like this, like, you know, so um, yeah, and like as so a lot of my um, like my own background is I'm half Japanese um, and my and half and half white. But um, so but 2020 has been a really transformational year. Um, it's been really hard year, obviously, but really transformational in terms of my own identity as learning as like as a BIPOC artist and kind of seeing my um, and kind of unpacking a lot of that. Like so, my my grandparents were both in the Japanese internment, um, and that's how they end up coming to Alberta. Um, and so my grandfather was actually one of the people who fought for the civil rights for Japanese people um, after World War II at the Alberta Legislature. So um, a lot of my masters, um, at my MFA thesis right now is actually around. Um, both, it's a kind of intersectionality between feminism as well as my own mixed race background um, and kind of, uh, it's around the, the female samurai, the own Onibugesha and kind of like um, when I realized that like, that there's actually was female samurai and now based on archaeological digs in Japan um, that they actually did exist. I'm, I started digging into like what erased histories really are and dominant narratives. So I'm using a lot of my work at the Glenbows that well as well in that as well as developing a lot of academic programs and school programs around uh, dominant narratives and erased histories and digging into a lot of those histories that aren't told um, especially of indigenous folk and queer folk and and like black and black like pioneers in the city like there's so many amazing stories that just kind of get like like lost over by a lot of the of the colonial and patriarchal gaze that's kind of happens um but it's been really like the more i got heavy into my masters i really realized that like everything is so intersectional in terms of a lot of the activism too in terms of indigenous rights um and black rights and you know and queer rights and feminism um you can't really take one without the other in lots of ways and um you know everyone has and all these struggles are so intertwined and stuff so it's really really interesting to kind of and so as i got heavier into more things like you know a lot of the a lot of feminism uh, theory and stuff um i became obviously way more involved in the yeah, things like black lives matter and especially like in our in in big kitty crew we have such a wide diversity um of female identifying artists already so in the last couple of years we, we've done a lot in working um with like a lot with like with all of our like LGBT 
to us um, artists, but uh, recently we've been doing a lot more work, especially with uh, like Dish Dishima. She runs Afros in the City, which is like a, a black advocacy group. Um, and so we uh, we partner in a lot of things with her as well too. And and she's like a really important part of the kitty too. <laughs> oh, I'll, I, I couldn't agree more. I wish I could have her on as well. And, you know, well, I, I hope to get there. I hope that people will want to, you know, um, chat a, a little bit about more who they are because, um, and the other part too, I think is, um, you know, Calgary has such a, a stigma around it all across the country. Everybody thinks we're the wild west and a bunch of um, cowboys and that. And while there are lots of that, don't get me wrong, there's so much more to us that never gets really said. So um, the medium of podcasting was something new to me. And then, you know, it's just been evolving. Now I have video with it. And with you doing a magazine, and I mean, obviously, just to showcase more of it, to me, that's just another great medium to showcase all of this. So I don't know, I might have to have you on like regularly talking about like quarterly to talk about, hey, what's new and upcoming in your magazine. So that totally. that way we can like, you know, uh, blast it out there. And I would love to feature like the uh, the collaborations that you're doing along with like, so it's like, it's with uh, Christine Cook at Chaos, right? Yeah. 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 So I used to work with, I used to do work with Christine at, when I was, when I was a quick draw animation before. So we have a, we know each other well, but so Tev, definitely like, I'd love to like um, hear about the things that you're involved with too. Cause like I so always email me with like, and we have, um so while the print magazines come out quarterly, we do have an online magazine that will be like, as like an ongoing thing, kind of like, Kind of as like as, as like the Vice website, so all like just like like constantly updating uh, stories, and we also have um I have a, a monthly section in in the, the Scene uh, magazine as well, which comes out every uh what's that? It's every it's every month, and so we have like a one page section in there, um and we have and then yeah when our magazine launches, it's going to become uh part of it's going to be in, as distributed with the Scene, but we also have our own distribution as well. And then actually in, in the spring, we actually have a bunch of street boxes that I've already acquired too, that we're going to be putting across Calgary. So that way the paper, in you know, the papers and the magazines free for everyone anyways, but that way it can be available for everybody on the street. You don't have to go into a business to get it. So yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. It's accessible for, for everybody, you know, it's like, I want it to be something that like anyone can read and I want everyone to kind of feel like they have a, have a part in it too, in a place and they can see themselves in that. Um, that's something that's really been missing. I feel like in mainstream media. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, this is so great. I'm so grateful to have you on and have you talking about these things because I don't know about a lot of them. Um, I live way in the suburbs, way in the Northeast. So I miss a lot of the stuff that happens downtown as well. And, uh, you know, I'll go to Inglewood and we have our favorite Vietnamese uh, restaurant that we go there. And, you know, every so often I'll pick out the magazine and see what's happening in the rest of the city. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Where do you think we'll be able to find your magazine? So the magazine is just is going to be distributed um, at over 200 uh, different locations uh, in the inner city and downtown core. So, but it isn't going to be in like Stone Inglewood, Marta Loop, uh, 70th Avenue, Beltline, um, Kensington by the universities. Um, yeah, pretty uh, like down in Mission, pretty much like like all kind of like the popular, like walking kind of high traffic spots. Um, so, and they'll be located in like coffee shops and bars and venues, um, independent local businesses, um, as well as like some lo as local attractions, like, as well as like the sort of like National Music Center, Studio Bell, um, King Eddie, places like that. Um, and then art galleries, um, places like that. Yeah, so lots of, pretty much like, like readily available across the city um yes. so i've been lucky to have um be mentored uh by my old publisher from uh beetroot brad sim so and he also is a uh, the publisher uh or he works uh, on, on the calgary journal and he was with box and fast forward so we've been a long time publisher for over 30 years in the city so i've been lucky to have um, his mentorship on this as well as like his help with all the with all the distribution and getting it all set up. So it was really a big part. Uh, he, he was really like a pivotal part in terms of getting uh, this magazine like on its feet. And um, yeah, it's been, I've been so thankful for his mentorship too. Oh, that's awesome. There's nothing better than when that happens. I tell you, whole lot. I, um, yeah, well, I don't know what that looks like in the future, but I can't wait to get my hands on it. I can't wait to see it. And I, because I miss fast forward immensely. I would love to see, I, I would have wish it could have continued, but at the same time, sometimes things you know, pass the torch, here we are, and now we have something new and fresh, and, you know, we've had so much conversation about Black Lives Matter, and this, um, you know, bigger picture of racism and Indigenous education, so I'm really hoping this will help hit that mark, too, because, 
uh, everybody's like, well, where do I find information? And I'm like, how, like, I feel like that we're infiltrated right now with it. Like I can share information about, you know, how to be an ally to whichever community, probably four of them. And now that we're in COVID-19, I mean, I can watch something in Toronto and someone in Toronto can watch Vancouver. Like it's, it's so easy. It's, 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 I think it's accessible. Um, with the assumption and the caveat, of course, that you have the internet and that mm -hmm. you have the ability to, you know, have the um, computer or laptop to watch it. So, um, which is still a problem across the country. So, I mean, I guess we really want, that's why we really want to make sure the digital magazine is really strong too, but I am such a kind of sucker for print and I really love the accessibility of print too. Mm -hmm. I just know when I travel other places or other cities, um, I'm always picking up like a local print publication, you know, um, whether that be like just like a bar or like, you know, you're not at the airport, just kind of flipping through to see what's going on in the city. Um, but if you are a big fan of Fast Forward, the scene, the paper that we do have a column in, um, that is run by uh, Mike Bell, who from the Calgary Herald and Carrie Watson, who was with Fast Forward and Brad sim as well and that's um, a monthly listings paper and they have like featured stories and stuff but it's way it's way more of a, of a kind of mainstream look but it's more similar to fast forward and then we're kind of partnering in terms of them being like the other one which is like way more of the sub subculture the arts and the younger kind of magazine um the other one's kind of is targeted a little bit more towards like kind of like 40 50 plus and um yeah, all the Toronto team is like, it's mostly like white. So it's like, um, but, um, so I really want to have a different voice in it, but uh, they've also been amazing in terms of their support and helped me get this launched as well too. Um, so I think there is more than enough space for, in terms of both publications in the city, because they both have totally different roles in what they're doing. Um, and so, but yeah, it's like, it's really been like a dream. I never thought this would ever, would actually ever have my own magazine. So uh, when Brad approached me with saying like, I think it's, time and the perfect person to do this um I was like oh it's a crazy it's a endeavor but I have an amazing I got an amazing staff of writers and illustrators um I have an amazing illustrator um who's a non-binary um Riz and uh, they're just doing the most incredible illustrations in it uh, and I like graphic spreads um and it's gonna be really cool it's gonna be something totally different than um all the other magazines and newspapers that you see in the city because it's gonna have a way stronger um like graphic element to do it so oh, oh that's sister. great yeah and it's gonna be um full color and like a little bit smaller format so it's not like the large scale newspaper so it's something you can even like tuck into your, your bag and easily and so yeah we're really excited yeah so i have a, a 13 year old and you know she's a 13 year old calgarian so she needs something, you know, that's not something for her mom. <laughs> so okay. I think what you have is going to be fabulous. And yeah, no, I'm, well, you know, I'm her mom, so it's not as cool. So I can't wait to see this and, and show her and see what she thinks. And cause, oh, and she identifies as two spirit. Well, she identifies as two spirit to indigenous people. But when she's not with indigenous people, she's like, I don't want to explain this. So I don't know, I'm pansexual or, you know, like she'll just say what she, what she thinks is white enough for people to understand and she doesn't have to explain herself. Yeah. So it'll be well, really nice to have. So brave. Sounds so cool, your daughter. So it's Oh, like, yeah. she is the coolest. <laughs> I, I want to share her with the world, but sometimes the world is such a jerk. So <laughs> especially during COVID-19 times. Oh, la. I know. It's like Calgary's an interesting place to be because I feel like, um, yeah, when I was in art school, I never imagined I'd always stay in Calgary. But then after art school, I ended up starting a studio here, um, a business. And it, even though like you think of it as kind of this like right wing old school place, it actually is. It's a really exciting place for the for right now for arts too. You know, there's a lot of um, like room for growth right now. And you see people really making these like big changes and these like big moves. Um, and I think people are receptive to it. It's like, you know, it's like, of course, there is always going to be um, a little bit of pushback. But um, I'm so thankful that I've been able to like, st to stay in Calgary. And you know, and I think it's really important because you actually get to make a larger impact here than the one I do. Because I, I, I do, I, I do show across the country and internationally and stuff. But I always like come back to Calgary because you just kind of have a different sense of community. Um, and you actually have a chance to like, kind of like change some people's minds here, you know, in this in the city too. Yeah, well, and I think like our city has changed so much. So I was born here in 77. And by then, like 16th Avenue was like the end of the city <laughs> for the most part, especially on the east side. So like all of the northeast is like brand new in the last like 40 years. The house I live in 
was literally surveyed the, when I was born. So, you know, it, it's just so weird because like we've evolved so much and so quickly and now we have to evolve our story. And when you say there's room for growth, like, yeah, a huge room for growth and huge gaps too. So it'll be really exciting to see, you know, more art everywhere and more, more localized art. I really can't wait to get rid of those Beaufort tower, towers one day, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but something imagine- more here. So. There's still like, it's like interesting to see just like how the demographic of Calgary's changed so much too. It's like, as like, you're saying you live in the Northeast, like there's like so many cool, we're going to profile a cool, couple cool pockets of places in the Northeast too. Cause it's like, just seeing like, um, kind of like a lot of these cultural hubs that I got like up in Falconridge is almost like a, kind of like a, it's like a little India area, you know? And there's like all these cool little businesses and like stores that, you know, no one, and they're like such cool, like almost like, like, you know, like local secrets that I think like people need to like learn about them and stuff. Cause it's like, um, just even though we are being distributed mostly downtown, I want the stories are being featured about all across Calgary, but especially ones in like really diverse neighborhoods. Um, especially like I like up in the northeast and Forest Lawn, everything too. Um, but even though like, teaching like after t- I've been teaching in schools for probably eight or nine years, and just seeing the demographic of students change so much, um, you know, and it's been really it's been so interesting, and it's it's it's, it's really rich because it brings such so many different stories um, to even to, to the classroom and to like turn to the whole city and um it's been like sometimes and those are like some of the most amazing stories that you hear is how many of the of these personal struggles and that everyone has gone through um and what kind of brought them to calgary and what makes them want to stay here and, and they make it their home a hundred percent and like we have like huge celebrities that come out of here like andrew funk from the, i know right yeah. like, so we have like we have we have lots to brag about, but we just don't. So I'm really excited to see that in, reflected in your magazine. And, you know, hopefully it's something really cool my, my daughter wants to aspire to be in because uh, she seems to be really into the arts. But I don't know what that looks like because when I was 13, I was going to be an Egyptologist. And yet I'm not an Egyptologist or never ended up going to school for that. So, <laughs> well, it's like um, even like we're, we're working on a bunch of kind of like as like youth programs and stuff. And so we do do some like mentorship programs under like name Lil Kitty, uh, which is like, but your daughter would be kind of even closer to like more like the big kitty age. So I, I welcome her if she ever wants whenever the pandemic or if ever she wants to come down to our studio and check it out. And- and to do like an art jam or be more than happy to have her down here and hang out and yeah and have her like surrounded with a bunch of other like female artists and stuff and kind of like get her involved in the community uh we also have like at my at the big kitty studios uh we have um a feminist library that i've curated um as available for the public for anyone to sign books out for free whenever they want um i was like gifted this amazing uh, book collection uh, by mary spot she's like one of the most iconic like feminist artists um in Canada, her work's like in the National Art Gallery. Um, and uh, so um, she was one of my professors at ACAD and when she had heard I was doing my MFA around a lot of feminist and intersectional theory, um, she gifted me her book collection that was pivotal in terms of making her body of work in the 60s and 70s. So it's a lot of like the original, her original books and her and like the writings and, that she, and the readings that she was doing in, to create this important body of work um, with like all her little notes and everything still. So when she gifted me this, this amazing collection. I was like, what am I going to do with this? I made this like public library um, and it's all available for um, viewing and browsing on our website on bigkittycrew.com. You can go to the feminist library. Um, and then I've, I, I've been adding contemporary titles um, to it too. So there's like, um, yeah, so it's a growing library. I think it's over like 400 books, I think so far, but, and it's available downtown. And if anyone wants to sign stuff out, it's free and you can uh, keep it for, for as long, I, I don't really have a timeline on it. You can keep it as long as I'm just, it's like, I'm trusting people. And then just, just you know, I just really want to share like this amazing resource uh, with other people. And even to see like how much um, the whole study of feminism has changed. And I think this is a really important discussion to see because um, like, I know like when I started Big Kitty, I never in a Big Kitty crew, I, I, I never intended it to be like a feminist project. It was only because like, I started as like a, as like a graffiti writer and I was the only female uh, graffiti writer I knew and so when I started meeting other um, 
like women uh, kind of in that scene, we kind of just like sort of like started as like kind of loose collective. And now it's grown to become this like organization um, that's recognized as kind of one of like leading like feminist organizations um, in the province stuff, which is like crazy. So it just was one of the big reasons why I actually went back to get my master's because I was like, I really want to like brush up on like all my feminist theory um, and to have a good, have, have a deeper understanding of the movement just because it is such a diverse movement um, in terms of like how people identify with it. And I think it's like feminism has been interesting because it's because was kind of ha was kind of had almost almost like a dirty word for a while, you know, the idea that people really thought that feminism was about man hating and um, really dividing and like my view of feminism is so different on that because um, men are some of my biggest champions and supporters on this and I think like feminism is a movement that needs to get everyone involved not just women it needs to be um, men um, you know like queer folk everybody needs to be on the um, on it um, and you know and it's and it's and it's not about like telling anyone what to do it's I think like you can be a feminist and have be some from so many different backgrounds um it's just about making um uh, you know fighting for like equality and like you know equal pay and equal rights and equal representation um but by no means is it by is it taking away from anyone else I don't feel like you know it's the same thing how it's like I feel like the same with like with like you know indigenous rights and black rights we're not really no one's really fighting for to bring other people down you're just kind of fighting for your own like fair you know for your own fair space like in in the game essentially you know yeah I know equality why is that such a hard concept hey <laughs> You know, it's just like, it's like, just because like we're taking a piece of the pie doesn't mean you get less of like a piece of pie. It's like, and there's more than for everyone, you know? So oh, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And no, um, I really, so I think like, yeah. it's oh, like been a really exciting journey for me. And I guess like in the last, like, well, you know, like for the last, like in like the last like 10 years, I've really, I have like how I see myself, I guess, like as like a feminist, like leader and activist, and then as a BIPOC artist um, and kind of like my role in terms of working as an arts educator um, and as an artist here in Calgary. Yeah, that's amazing. And so first and foremost, yeah, my, I'm going to like totally stock everything that you're doing and show my daughter and hope to encourage her to come. She's actually being homeschooled right now. Uh, we made that choice uh, because of COVID-19, but mm -hmm. it was that bigger. She made the choice because of what she was facing in the schools. So um, we decided to homeschool and art is a big focus for her. Photography is. So I'd love to have her somehow in your in your world and um and see where where that goes and then that bigger part too that i just i want to promote whatever you're doing because um everything you just said is incredibly important to me and um i think we have to lift each other up all the time and then the other part is like showcase i mean i how do i not know about a lot of your own library i'm like oh well first and foremost i have books to donate but two you know that bigger picture because my, my husband's been giving me a hard time. Like, okay, we're starting to get too many books. And I'm like, oh, there's no such thing as too many books. But there is such a thing as too yeah. many books. So. <laughs> but yeah. But like, 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 thank you. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it's been, thank you so much. And it was like so awesome having you reach out to me today. Because I was like, and then like learn about your podcast. Because like, I am definitely going to be a subscriber now. And like, here at everything you're doing. And I would love, and I really want to elevate all the all the voices that you have on your on your program and it's so important to have an outlet like this and it's like so and yeah it meant like the world because it's like to have support from other like you know like BIPOC and artists and and makers in the scene it means the world to me so thank you so much for this, having the platform yeah no I can't wait and I know I have a book from uh, the Sakamoto's uh, he was one of our candidates that ran in Medicine Hat but he made a, a book or maybe his son made a book about their families um uh in term camp history oh wow yeah so Amazing. i have that book i haven't read it yet but i'm like okay but obviously i need to donate it to you so that we can lend it out and i will read it before i give it to you but <laughs> oh no for sure i was like i'm we, we're, we're, I, I love taking the donations to the library for sure too so and that's amazing and any type of like sharing like that it's really neat because it's like i'm actually producing right now another project i'm working on um is i'm working on a theater production right now with cloudsway dance theater so um my in terms of like my own professional artwork i was no i'm known for doing large-scale 
installations and sculptural works and like theatrical stage designs. I work in film um, too. So, but I did, I've been working with Cloudsway Dance Theater for the last couple of years. And when I met uh, Kunji Ikeda, uh, the artistic director, um, I, I read about it actually him in, a, in Metro. And then I went to his show. It was a one man show about the Japanese internment and his family's journey. And when I saw it, um, he was talking about how his family was taken away from Steveston, um, BC. And I found out that, and when that ended up from my grandma was taken away too. And it turns out our grandma actually lived like three doors down from each other and they're both taken down, taken away. <laughs> and, like, and we both ended up working and living in Calgary. We're the same age. And, and we both worked for One Little Rabbit and were mentored by Michael Green. And we both worked for Trickster Theater, but our paths had never crossed. And like, I don't know that many other Japanese Canadians um, in the city that aren't my own family. And I don't know, well, there, there is a big community. There is not a large community, but there's like a few, but especially people working in the arts um, around my age. So when I met him, we were like, we must collaborate. And we did a show a couple years ago called know the rules win the game and we toured that across Canada and we're working on this new show um, called the Momotaro movement um, and the whole cast is all Japanese Canadian um, um, and so we have a dancer from Toronto um, a um, an actor from uh, Edmonton um, and then I'm actually gonna be in the show as well which is I'm taking which is like and very rare and then and Kunji and we're developing the show um, with support of the Na National Japanese Canadian Association um, and the Pal Street Festival and we're hopefully taking it to um, tour on Japan next year if it's all kind of COVID dependent so it's a really interesting story because it's about like the theatrical show is about kind of like um, we're taking a classical Japanese fairy tale um, a narrative um, but then kind of deconstructing it um, with kind of these like feminist and like undertones and examining uh, the, the male ego, um, especially in Japanese culture, um, and kind of our, our own journey all being um, mixed race, uh, Japanese Canadian, because uh, Jap being Japanese Canadian is really different, is really interesting because uh, we have one of the highest intermarriage rates because due to the fact that Japanese Canadians were um, did, like we were like spread apart uh, after World War II and being so alienated um, in a lot of these like rural environments. Um, it has, uh, yeah, we have a 98% intermarriage rate. So like, so there's very few, I don't know anyone Japanese who's married to anyone Japanese. So, but with that said, we also like my generation is actually the very first generation of of, uh, of what's called half so like half Japanese and half white um, uh, because that before that like um, like you know like our grandparents were always marrying you know Japanese people so it's interesting to kind of see that now like our community is growing so much but almost everyone is half there's no one who's um, almost like whole Japanese Canadian so that's kind of changed the whole um, dynamic of what does it mean to be Japanese Canadian um, in Canada and also examining I guess like um, like how that happened and um, a lot of it was you know kind of it's in a lot of ways very similar to like a lot of indigenous struggles in terms of how of like of repressing you know um, different cultures and you yeah. know like a cultural side essentially yeah wow so today's the day before Remembrance Day and a uh, family tradition that we have. Um, so my husband and I used to teach scuba out at um, Lake Minnewanka prior to having a child. And out at Lake Minnewanka, we know the history of that really well because we used to scuba dive it. And there was a, a town there, a mining town named Bankhead. And because of, um, you know, they during the First World War, they used the War Measures Act to make a dam. And then during the Second World War, they used the War Measures Act to make a second dam. So they basically relocated this whole town and it completely closed. So the foundations are completely underwater, except for this, uh, there's Upper and Lower Bankhead. And Upper Bankhead has a one monument from the First World War and eight people who went and they memorialized them with this monument. But nobody ever goes there. So we go there every single year wow, <laughs> and we have a small say. ceremony. Yeah, and, and the small ceremony, like we, you know, we have our phones and we, we play last post and we have a minute of silence and then we play Ravel and, and um, at least, and I always smudge because, you know, that's, that's my culture. But, um, you know, it's that bigger picture of always acknowledge, acknowledging that where the uh, army camp was for the, for the army cadets was actually a former Japanese intern camp which is like yeah. literally right down the road from exactly where that monument is. So, what? yeah, so it, it, it's, um, you know, we've never marked the Japanese internment camp there. And uh, they just recently closed the cadet army uh, or the army cadet camp that, that was there. And now it's like a, a little airstrip. So, and it looks like they're going to develop it into some kind of tourist spot. And I'm like, how many people from all across the world, including Japanese tourists, 
are literally on top on top of the spot where their own people were in an internment camp and they don't know it and as you know we went we whitewash everything so if we don't advocate for it it might not happen but then on the flip side like my next book club is on the uh, missing uh, monuments around the Indian residential schools mm -hmm. and we have so much private land that's been given to uh, farmers and such that are you know um, <laughs> they're dead indigenous kids scattered mm -hmm. all around and farmers just farm over top of it and uh, we don't have access to some of those spots anymore so um, I, I, we, there's a bigger picture of what we need to do there, but also that when we have Memorial Day or uh, Remembrance Day and we're trying to remember these things and I feel really bad about not being able to go. But as you know, we're having like a huge snowstorm <laughs> and it's, know, it's totally like fleshy and wet and I know tomorrow the roads will be awful. So I can't even go and I feel awful about it. So um, there's so much there to talk about and unpack and I just don't even know where to start. But um yeah, so what and do you- I always think really, oh, sorry. I think it's always really interesting to think about our members say too, is like also like all the contributions that like indigenous, um, sort of like Canadians put, uh, gave in World War One, and World War Two as well. Like, you know, with like Francis P P P P Gamo, right, like sorry, my pronunciation, like he was like the most decorated like soldier in like all First World War and you know, and the role that he'd had and it's like, I mean, Japanese Canadians weren't allowed to serve in World War II, but it's like, um, some of them did serve in World War One, and it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's appalling to think about, like, the how, about the treatment of, you know, of, of these, of these Canadians, and how their sacrifice that they gave, um, and then came back to just face, just even, like, for, like, worse discrimination, almost, in so many ways, you know? Yeah, totally. Well, so much so, we have a whole, like, Indigenous Veterans Day that is separate from Remembrance Day, because um, they wouldn't recognize us as people and, and give us rights. And uh, it w my understanding, it was the World War II vets that actually worked together. So my, our allies, like the non-Indigenous Canadian allies, that would have helped Indigenous with getting the right to vote because they did serve in the wars. And, mm -hmm. you know, and the, it, like it, it's just so, like, when you look at our history, it, it's impossible for me to wrap my head around all of that. So it's really important that we heal through the arts, I think. And um, I never anticipated a podcast be part of my healing journey, but it is. But uh, and what I'm finding more and more in the art scene is that everybody's art is uh, reflective of their journey, their experience, and sometimes their intergenerational history. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really, really enjoying this new world. That's for sure for me. And I'm grateful that uh, people like yourself and you know, I, I've met so many artists that have just devoted their life to art. And now, you know, we're st really starting to see this um, BIMPOC. I, I say BIMPOC because um, mixed is the M. So uh, BIMPOC uh, artists that are putting out all this great info about a million things. And it's yeah. just, it, that's how we learn history, I think, is through the arts now. I know it's been like, well, even like a perfect example is like looking um, at, you know, the Jay Sterling's new mural in Chinatown, you know, uh, the Black Lives Matter mural. Um, I mean, that story that he's featuring on the mural about John Ware, that's always been like one of my favorite stories. Uh, when I was, whenever I'm, when I teach the Glembo, I make sure like I tell everybody that story because like such an amazing, incredible story um, to hear and something you don't even, even like hear of that often. Um, and then, so as I've been developing this course with the Glembo in terms of dominant narratives um i came across also the story of charles daniels and charles daniels was actually the very first um um he was a he was a, he, was, he was a black man and he um uh, was a rail porter for the cp rail and he bought a ticket to go see king lear at the at the grand theater so what was called the sherman grand back then in 1914 um and they wouldn't let him sit um on the main floor he had to go sit they wanted a different they wanted a different section um and he actually fought um he actually fought the sherman grand theater and he took him to court and it was actually the very first and he actually won the case he won a thousand dollars and it was actually the very first successful civil rights case in all of Western Canada and no one even talks about that um, he actually took Senator Lougheed to court over it and so the fact that there was um, the story and this theater still exists um, I've been talking to uh, Making Treaty 7 and the theater and trying to see if we can um, get another, you know, some kind of um, yeah like a, a kind of art project going and stuff around that because okay, I think it's like I, there's all I, mean, I just can I just ask you about that did you say Sarah Lougheed Senator Lougheed. Senator Lougheed, sorry. Um, because, uh, so the original Lougheed family, 
the woman was actually um, Métis. And it was Ella. Yeah, and that, that whole area was the French quarters that, that uh, you know, whitewash and e English wash. Um, I read a lot about how uh, the English speaking Albertans really wanted to make Alberta English speaking only and really tried to force out French. So I would assume that was what happened in Southwest Calgary where they changed everything from French to English and that's where she had lived. And uh, she's one of the first Métis that the Blackfoot didn't run out actually. So <laughs> it's the, no, they, it's about all he's an amazing story. So um, actually I did one of, I did a big show at the all he uh, house. Um, about two years ago, in 2019, so about a year and a half ago, um, I, 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 I did a show um, alongside the Queer Art Society and Pride, um, and it was presented by Big Kitty, and we, it was called Nine Lives, Exploring Notions of Femininity. So we had um, 12 different artists, uh, six uh, drag artists, um, uh, drag queens, and then six of the girls from Big Kitty, and we um, did these site-specific portraits um talking about what does it mean to be feminine or to be female so um and in our big kitty side we had um you know like molly fly who's a really big like queer dj and stuff um and then everyone like made um their own kind of and curated their own image a lot of them we, we made our own uh, different pieces and wearable art um but that was and one of the one of the girls did a portrait about um isabel lockheed and stuff but now as i was involved being more involved with the lockheed house um we really we thought was really interesting because they approached me to vote I had kind of just talked about the show and then they were like we really want to do it and they got the funding um in they got funding from CADA for it um and everything and and it was really interesting to see why they wanted to do this kind of show and it was because of how the Lockheed House um has been a really important part in terms of for women in the city for a really long time because like um yeah Isabella Lockheed pretty much ran the house but because you know when, when when her husband was always away and she raised all the kids there so it was kind of like her house essentially so and then after the Lockheeds did lose it um then it became actually um the place where they trained um women for in for World War II so they was like so it was, it was a training facility for um women like learning how to be doing mechanics and all kinds of like work and um in World War II and then after that um it became a um a, a spot for the Red Cross for um, blood donations um, in the 60s and 70s and in the 80s it was actually closed and it was kind of a gay stroll around there in that park um, and then in the 90s it was bought again um, by a conservation society and now it's um, a national historic site and preserved um, so but to see its lifetime of that house it's been such it's been pretty much always inhabited and kind of um, managed by female run organizations and really strong women so that's why they thought it was a really important show to curate inside the house um, to showcase kind of the continuing eras of I guess like um, you know influential women in the city um, and also I thought it was really cool to see how the Lahi House was so progressive um, in how they want to reach out um, to organizations in their city to work with because when you walk by it it kind of looks like a really colonial like old fashioned like um traditional house um that wouldn't really be that welcoming um to all of these diverse communities um and arts organizations but they are so open and so amazing to work with and like it's really interesting because they really want to make it a hub for the community and make it like welcoming for everyone to come in you know and really break those like stigmas and um, and everything they're doing from like, you know, like dog parades outside to tons of pride events and like, you know, like drag brunches. It's so cool to see, you know, and something that's really important because, um, yeah, even though sometimes you, we can judge people, I guess, um, on being, you know, really traditional or um, they're not people who are really often really progressive in the way they think, you know, you just don't really have to just have a chance to talk to them. Yeah, for sure. Um, when we first started Sovereign Spirits, we had a few of our meetings right in the park in front there because um, I was telling them the history. I, I was just finished reading um, Gay History and telling them about Loose, or uh, not Loser Loop, uh, uh, Fruit Loop. They called it the Fruit Loop, the mm -hmm. police, yeah. when they did that area because that was the stroll. And, uh, and I said Loser Loop because I'm in Forest Lawn and I had a cop literally say that to me while I was doing a walk like with my safety vest on and a group of people we were doing a walk around forest lawn and this cop called it loser loop right to my face so um and then i was like you know the fruit loop they used to the police called it the fruit loop so i gotta get away from like getting away from cop terms for sure when it comes yeah, to I didn't know that was progressive i'm sure <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But I mean, I think it's like even like, I mean, in the magazine, even for McKinney Magazine, we're really talk like one of our next our features in the spring issue is talk, talking with the, the Black Sex Workers Collective out of um, out in New York because they're a big advocacy group. And I think was like even talking about like, you know, like sex workers and breaking down like the stigma around a lot of these um, is like it's so important and um, especially like for the safety and, you know, and for like, you know, the like the ability of like of all these of all these women and men working in this in these fields you know and um yeah i couldn't agree more i um so cindy gladue is a case that really affected me and uh it was actually shift calgary that was one of the we had two um rallies and the second one they didn't come but the first one they did come and it did mean a lot to me because um i think that the sex workers need a lot more advocacy um you know we have we <laughs> I'm still working on trying to just destigmatize um, uh, cannabis, you know, and there's so much that all together, all that harm reduction comes together. And when I ran, I talked about harm reduction, both at the municipal and provincial level. And obviously I've worked as hard as I can federally at it too. I just wish that we could decriminalize everything. Um, Cause it, to me, especially with sex, sex work, it's that patriarchy, that control over um, our bodies. Like it's just not enough that they control the economy, the land, everything, but now they want our bodies too. And I just, it's just not okay. <laughs> we have to fix it. Definitely. It's like, yeah. And I think like, yeah, like for sure being like, you know, giving women like more protection in terms of and own ownership of what they're doing with their own bodies is like, you know, um, it makes it just a really safe environment for everybody. And, but um, I like, I will give like kudos to the city, at least like they're trying to defund the police. And that's like, you know, really big, it, that was like, that was really inspiring to see, you know, in terms of, um, but we'll see how that goes. Fingers yeah, we'll see, where it goes. <laughs> we'll see how it right. goes. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it gives you like a kind of like, like at least like, you know, like a little bit of hope or like a glimmer of hope of what's going on, you know, um, you know, for not, when the rest of the provinces, you know, under Jason Kenney and, you know, and they're you know, doing all these crazy cuts and everything. And, but so at least I feel like there's some, some hope going on though, right? Let, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you got to go for it. And like, I, I have a little one, so you know, I got to give her a better world than I, what I was gifted. That's for sure. So thank you so much for being on my show, Jenny. Well, thank you so much for talking. And, I, and I'm really excited to have an ongoing, to keep working with you and those ongoing conversation and definitely. And um, I can't wait to like showcase some of your work and, and elevate the work that you're doing too. And yeah, I, I really applaud you. It's really important. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, you've been leading in the city. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I do this like long-winded exit. So one, you can you could leave if you wanted to. But two, if you want to just stay and add what you want to say, you're more than welcome to. I'm happy to stay and listen to you, but sure, it's fine. <laughs> that would be awesome. So yeah, just chime in if you hear something that you want to add to, because um, anyone who listens to my podcast knows what I'm about to say, but it's important to me because um, the reason why I say this is that I, I've been really lucky to get uh, wonderful guests like you come on my show. And uh, what ends up happening is that that might be the one show that all your friends and family listen to. Right. So it, it's like, okay, if you only listen to one show, this is what I want you to know. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay. Indigenous have been talking about our issues, sharing our traumas in reports, commissions, and public hearings so it can be regularly disregarded. No more. Honor our words. Honor the treaties. Listen to politicians and their policies and platforms. If they don't recognize the marginalized with their budget, with Gender Equity Plus, if they're cutting violence prevention programs and services, Indigenous education, uterus health choices, gay and straight alliances, a lack of human rights for migrants, for immigrants, for folks with disabilities, know that your vote to that party directly negatively impacts marginalized people. Demand that they implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, the recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the multiple reports about child welfare reform, silence prevention, and now, or sorry, violence prevention, not silence prevention. <laughs> and now 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and Two-Spirit. Denying these reports is a form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme racism in the educational, justice, and health institutions with multiple reports that say the same things. Demand change from election platforms and politicians. If they don't understand colonialism, racism, privilege, and sexism, they literally have zero business running. This should be understood by all parties, local politicians, community organizations, sports clubs, etc. 
A really great article I said out loud is Truth Before Truth, How Non-Indigenous Canadians Become Allies. I want to continue putting cultural safety into action so you can create a safer space for Indigenous people, people of colour, those with disabilities, LGBTQ2+, and others that are being oppressed. Look at it as first aid for marginalization. First, you have to do something. Having good intentions is not enough. You have to take action to make change. You have to speak out against racism. You have to ask questions with those with more understanding. You have to find allies and create a support system for yourself to help you advocate for culturally uh, safe approaches. You have to take responsibility for your learning. Just as I'm learning from Jenny today about uh, different things that are happening in the city, you have to learn about Indigenous people as well. Read, reflect, ask questions. Do not expect this learning to come from Indigenous people when there's so many resources available. Just as for me, there's so many resources available for me to learn about other people. Take time for self-reflection. Beware of your own assumptions, biases, question everything you've learned about Indigenous people, and take steps to actively disrupt those stereotypes. Commit to lifelong learning. Be prepared to be uncomfortable. Understanding colonialism and the legacy of racism is an ongoing and difficult task. And I want to say thank you to heretohelp.bc.ca, what is Indigenous cultural safety and why I should care about it for that resource. Internalized racism or lateral violence is another form of violence Indigenous and marginalized people face by the structure of racism imposed on these lands. Um, what is internalized racism by Donna Bevins is a great resource. Do's and don'ts uh, for bystander intervention by American Friends Service Committee gives us um, what's to do. So if you witness public instances of racism, anti-Black, anti-Muslim, anti-trans, anti-Indigenous, or any other form of oppressive interpersonal violence and harassment, use these tips on how to intervene while considering the safety of everyone involved. Do make your present known as a witness. If possible, make contact with the person being harassed and ask them if they need support. Move closer to the person being harassed if possible and you feel that you can do so, create a barrier between the person being harassed. Um, if it's safe to do so and the person consents, film the, or record the incident, incident as it's happening because it's a lot easier to delete it later. But take cues from the individual being harassed. Is the person engaging with the harasser? Can you make suggestions? Um, notice if the person being harassed is resisting in their own way and honor that especially white folks, don't tone police the person being harassed. Follow up with the person being harassed after the incident is over and see if they need anything. I know for me, it's been, um, it's very embarrassing when things like that happen. So just passing someone your card so that they can choose to throw it out later, but at least then they're validated that this incident happened. And if later they do choose to do something more, then you're part of that in a good way for them but do what you have to do to keep yourself safe. Assess your surroundings, see if there's others that you can pull into support. Working as a team is a better idea if possible. And if you can just move to a safer place, do that. Do not call the police. For many communities experiencing harassment now, whether you're indigenous, Arab, Muslim, black, queer, trans, immigrant, the police can actually be a greater danger for the person being harassed. I think we've done enough shows on this podcast from Sonny, um, crazy bull to the English family to know that calling the police is not good if you're Indigenous for sure. Don't escalate the situation. The goal is to get the person being harassed to safety and not incite further violence from the attacker. But don't do nothing. Silence is dangerous. It communicates approval and leaves the victim high and dry. If you find yourself too nervous or afraid to speak out, move closer to the person being harassed to communicate your support with your body. Teach your kids about accountability in a positive way because they are learning it from somewhere. If you're experiencing emotional distress and want to talk, you can call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 1-855-242-3310. It is toll free, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Violence is my everyday reality. Every Indigenous generation has faced it. That's why I started this podcast, to speak freely, without interruption, without tone police, without leadership shaming, without gaslighting questions, as many people don't want to hear Indigenous opinion, sure want to tell us theirs, and by people who know nothing about Indigenous, know nothing about colonialism, nothing about the constant surveillance of Indigenous people, our protests, our vigils, and our rights. 
just typical microaggressions, people dealing with internalized racism, those who are gatekeepers that survive off the status quo, or people who are really in their trauma, and they stop people from doing the daily work that needs to get done or deplete personal resources. External and internal racism is an everyday reality for Indigenous people. That's why I started this podcast, as a boundary to be heard. Thank you to my ancestors, my granny, my mom of what strength looks like through your example. I want to thank my dad for teaching me to be strong and blunt, my stepmom for showing me what a proud culture is through her Austrian roots, and teaching me to be a proud Calgarian. It is through her I am a second generation proud Calgarian. I want to say thank you to Darcy for producing and editing this show. On top of being my husband, childhood friend, father of our child, and support down my journey of the Red Road, he has witnessed decades of racism and sexism. And to our child, who we are blessed to learn from daily, we are honored you chose us. You give me daily accountability to be a better and stronger person. I hope my daughter and my family will be proud in the future of us trying to discuss these present day issues in a way that they can understand down the road. Again, my Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you, Adam, Agent Indian, Alexandria, Beatrice, Ben, Beth, Brian, Kat, Celine, Christina, Crystal, Diana, Jacqueline, Jana, Jenny, Jessica, Jocelyn, Judy, Karen, Kathy, Kenna, Leah, Lisi, Marisa, Melissa, Morami, Natalie, Nathan, Rebecca, Rochelle, The Sprawl, Shara, Sharon, Tammy, Tiffany, Thaya, Vanessa, and Veronica. Thank you all for signing up. If you did one donation or many or had to quit for financial reasons, know that I've appreciated your support. If you value listening and can afford to give, thank you. For those that cannot afford to give but listen in, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com where you can send in your comments or questions. You can go to Native Calgarian for the latest podcast and it's always the pin post on social media. And I wanna end by giving that side eye to those Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not tradish. And my beautiful cousin would respond, or you'd be in my dish. Thank you for listening. <laughs> and that is that. Amazing. 